students and other and, and other professionals as well. All right, so I'm Katie Coggin, um, and then my colleague Kim Free has already introduced herself. These are our glamour shots. Um, <laughs> we have been GT learning teachers in the Cherry Creek School District in Denver, Colorado uh, for several years. We were lucky enough to meet through the doctoral program at the University of Denver. Um, these uh, lessons that we're about to share, this practical application, um, is really based on uh, Kim's dissertation. So I feel very fortunate that she um, <laughs> well, allows me to work with her and collaborate <laughs> to create these lessons and teach them to students. All right, so here's our agenda. Um, Kim and I have been lucky to present this a couple of times. Um, so this will look a little bit different because you are all clearly Dabrowski F, um, experts, but um, Kim is going to share um, our rationale, a, a little bit of the results of her research that got us to this point, um, the overexcitabilities and how we present those to students, um, the lessons we do um, with the picture books in the OEQ2, and then how we use that to use for um, the affective learning plans. All right, so our rationale for being here is really important. Um, gifted readers often struggle to understand their social emotional needs. And if we can help them embrace their unique needs and overexcited abilities, we can help them develop a lot of self-confidence and self-awareness. Understanding who they are and what their quirks are will help them overcome challenges that they face as gifted students with their age ability peers. Um, and finally, information gained by students can help their affective goals on GT learning plans, which we do yearly as GT teachers in Colorado. And so here's some information just about Dabrowski that we would share some of this with students and um, basically just really pointing out the overexcitabilities as, as this part of the lesson that we're going to do. So uh, we get this question a lot. Do gifted readers really struggle in the classroom? And um, the, the research is really clear that um, gifted readers do struggle in traditional classrooms since they usually can read from a very young age. Um, there's very little research specifically around gifted readers, but what is out there is a, paints a pretty bleak picture of um, the instruction that gifted readers receive in classrooms. Often the thinking is that since they can read and they're so far ahead of everyone else, that just kind of leave them in the corner and they'll be fine on their own. And so they don't receive a lot of information, a lot of attention from their teachers. Gifted students and especially gifted readers need and deserve rich learning opportunities to interact with literature in deep and meaningful ways. In addition to being important for their academic development, it's also essential for their active affective development as well. So as, as Katie said, I completed doctoral research around um, how parents and teachers can support the affective development of gifted readers. And in my research, the three overexcitabilities that came up the most were intellectual, emotional, and imaginational. So every student in my research had at least one of these three overexcitabilities that parents and teachers identified. Um, parents and teachers also shared that affective supports include quality literature, reading logs, million word club, books on affective needs, um, which is what we are here for today. And then affective barriers included using gifted readers as tutors, extreme introversion of gifted readers, and a lack of service options for twice exceptional um, gifted readers. And so I based my research around Judith Halstead's book called um, Some of My Best Friends Are Books. And in her book, she believes that gifted readers potentially struggle in four affective areas, developing identity, perfectionism, balancing introversion with social expectations, and then relationships. So my research indicated that parents and teachers view gifted readers as being positive, morally and socially aware, and they have a positive identity overall. Some are introverted, 
Some use books as barriers. Um, some are extroverted. Some prefer to be with other kids rather than reading. And parents and teachers view gifted readers as well-adjusted, outgoing, and see a range of being popular with peers to having a preference toward adults. But all gifted readers need academic peers. So additional themes in my research included um, how in curriculum gifted readers develop perseverance and grit when they're reading difficult material, higher level questioning leads to great discussions, and quality literature broadens their worldview. Um, as far as pedagogy, bibliotherapy is an effective tool for meeting the affective needs of gifted readers. Gifted readers see books as a sanctuary. Um, one parent in my research reported that her daughter took Lord of the Rings to homecoming <laughs> as a crutch for her to, um, to use because she felt insecure socially. Um, as far as intentions, um, parents and teachers believe that books open doors to new places and censorship was not an issue for parents at all, um, who basically allow their children to read anything within reason and only censor for extreme violence and or sexual content. Um, Dabrowski's overexcitabilities again came up over and over again. Um, they were present with all gifted readers in my research. Gifted kids make deep connections with books, often lasting into adulthood. Gifted readers have a strong moral compass, and the invisible struggle of parents dealing with overexcitabilities of gifted readers is real. Most parents felt um, very alone and isolated because other parents didn't really have sympathy for their struggles because their kids could read. And so they felt like those parents shouldn't complain if their students were struggling. Um, they reported feeling really alone and guilty for even complaining because again, at least their children had the ability to read and were, were good readers. So by working on affective development, we are also increasing their academic experience as well. Supporting the affective development matters for all students. So now we're gonna talk about some practical applications. All right, I was so enthralled listening to, listening to you talk about your research, I forgot this was my part. So, <laughs> um, the, this is the lesson sequence that I teach um, when I teach this in the classroom. So I work at a K-8 gifted magnet school. So a good, I would say around 50% of the kids are gifted um, right now at the school. So uh, this is the lesson timeline that I usually use. I'm going to show this again at the end after I show you my lesson sequence. Um, but this is just kind of a preview. Um, I usually start by giving the um, OEQ2, and we'll talk more about what that is later, um, if you're not familiar, um, introducing the overexcitabilities in the picture books, and then giving the results, um, and talking about, you know, kind of the pros and cons with students of the overexcitabilities. Okay, so for lessons one through five, um, introducing the overexcitabilities to students. Um, uh, I do, it's linked in the presentation that we've shared with um, Joy, but um, the link on the bottom of the screen right now is the presentation that I give to students. Um, and then I'm just going to go through really quick um, what I show to the students right now. And then um, I couldn't talk about books with students without um, giving a shout out to Bob Sini. Uh, if you're not from Colorado, um, you, he's a Colorado native. He was also um, on, on um, Kim's dissertation panel, but he, I think since like 1985, he's been doing a presentation um, at the Colorado Gifted Conference and I think at the National Gifted Conference on what's new in adult literature. And he's just really passionate um, about books. He starts all of his presentations with a read aloud. Um, he puts out this list every year um, and to, to give his recommendations for gifted re readers of what they should leave. So in our presentation, we've linked the most recent um, of his publications, What's New in Young Adult Literature, and there's kind of a little screenshot there um, of what um, he puts like a little description and blurb of what he thinks is recommended. And reads hundreds of books every year. <laughs> it's yeah. pretty amazing. And it, it is even what's great about his list, too, is he not only puts in books from like the current year, but sometimes he goes back and reads like classic books and he, he like if he's missed one, he'll throw it in there. 
All right, so this is how we introduce the overexcitabilities to students. Um, so I, I really stress the overexcitabilities that they're super sensitivity. So I talk about how not like, like you just don't feel this over, like it's super, you're like a superhero. Um, I also introduce these with icons because there's a lot of research about um, icons and retention for, um, for teaching. All right. So for each of the overexcitabilities, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> yeah. So we're going to just kind of go through sort of how we would present them to students, and um, and and just kind of show you how we would go through the process. So and again, like Katie said, the um, presentation that we're showing you right now is linked right here on the on the bottom of this slide, so you can see um, this part of the presentation. So, um, in, and it doesn't really matter which one you start with. Obviously you can start anywhere. We're gonna start with intellectual. Um, and so intellectual overexcitabilities are characterized by activities of the mind and intellectual overexcitability might include being extremely curious, love knowledge and problem solving, is always reading, um, always thinking about things and asking questions and in intellectual overexcitability, sorry, and over, excitable intellectual child can be incredibly focused for long periods of time. And so here are some picture books that we felt like addressed um, this overexcitability. Obviously there are hundreds probably out there that you could find, but these were just um, some that we have personally used with our students. Um, last to finish was recommended to me um, by a parent whose daughter would freak out if she wasn't the first one done in math assignments. She equated being first to being the smartest. And so you could um, either pick these books to read, you could provide these books for students to read on their own, depending on um, you know, what, what you wanted to do with it. Um, and again, research has shown that even high school students benefit from reading a picture book. So um, I don't think there's any specific level that you could cut off. You could definitely use this with, with students K-12. And so um, Daniels and Pachowski discuss overexcitabilities at length in their book, Living with Intensity, which was um, also a huge part of, of this presentation. And we'll talk more about the book in a little bit, um, but they believe it's essential to nurture constructive expressions of the overexcitability, and that's essential for growing up healthy. On the left, these are things that children should hear you say. And then on the right, you're given a list of strategies to encourage the modulation of the intellectual OE. Things like helping children develop goals, engaging in self-reflection based on steps toward the goals, and for the intellectual OE, you should say things like, your curiosity fuels your intelligence, or you really stuck to projects that interest you. And on the right, you can foster the OE um, by honoring the child's need to seek understanding and truth, regardless of their age, and allow them to develop their own projects based upon their individual interests, which is something they don't often get to do in traditional classrooms. All right, so the sensual overexcitability, um, and I, I do just want to back up and say when I when I show these to students, I usually just show the slides that look like this that with the icons. And what I do is um, <clears throat> I go through all the icons and then after each overexcitability, I give them time to talk. So I tell them to talk about, you know, which one of these are you, which one of these are not you, do you feel like this is an overexcitability you, you could have, because I'm really trying to foster um, awareness in the students. So like if I was showing this slide to student, I would go through each one of these and I would let them say, okay, um, um, I, maybe I have sensitivity to smells, but um, like I don't, I don't love comfort. And I, all, and I always give them examples of students like, um, you know, they're the student that wears he, this big Sherpa hat and this big um, blanket to school every day. Like that would be the kid with the sensory overexcitability. And then, um, just to put in here too, since I teach this to third and fourth grade students, I do call this the sensory overexcitability because um, I don't feel comfortable saying the word sensual to eight and nine year olds. Um, I was talking about uh, to Kim about this, that maybe this is the year that I need to be brave and just use the appropriate vocabulary. Um, 
And then these are the picture books that we uh, use with this overexcitability. Um, so I, I've, I've done this two ways. I've either um, presented these books to the students and said, um, you know, this is the overexcitability it shows. How do they show this? Um, I've also just given books out to kids in the class and let them um, try and guess what overexcitability they're trying to represent. And then finally, again, with that, that fostering awareness, um, these, uh, these pieces are really for things that we share with parents and teachers. Um, so again, things that parents and teachers need to say to students. Um, and then to things that we can do to support the modulation of this OE. All right, so the next one would be imaginational. So these would be the icons that we would show. And the imaginational child has free play of the imagination. They could have very clear and vivid dreams, a good sense of humor, magical and fantasy thinking, a love of poetry, music, and drama. They might enjoy visual visualization and daydreaming. Um, and daydreaming, sorry, is a key part of the um, imaginational overexcitability. So again, here are some picture books that we have used in the past that demonstrate the imaginational OE. Uh, Where the Wild Things Are is a really popular one, often with my students, um, especially younger students. Wordless picture books like Tuesday really appeal to the imagination of students of all ages. And they also lend themselves well to encouraging students to write about their ideas. So again, for the imaginational OE, they need to hear things like, you have a rich imagination or you view the world in a different way. Some strategies to encourage the modulation um, include using open-ended activities, providing opportunities for design and intervention. Um, try not to use a child's imagination against them or make fun of their unusual comments. Um, instead, provide outlets for their creative pursuits and allow them opportunities to daydream in the classroom, which I think is a hard one for sure. <laughs> All right, the psychomotor overexcitability. Um, I've found this one very interesting um, connecting to boys and girls just because um, we break down the words part, you know, psycho motor, and we talk about um, how it's a lot of energy. And it's not just um, like the boys who are really into sports connect with this one, but also there are some girls that really connect to this one because um, like the, the kids who like to, that, that can't hold it in, that like to shout out, um, that are really impulsive, um, that like that connects to the the girls too <clears throat> and then the books for this one um calvin and hobbs um love this i i call him the quintessential gifted kid i went through a period with one of my math groups where i would show a calvin and hobbs strip every day um i i had a math class one year that that found loopholes in everything I taught. And I was like, you know, I'm going to introduce you to the king of loopholes. <laughs> so every day um, I would show one of those. Um, Edie is a great one for girls. Um, Billy's Booger. Like, I think the psychomotor kids um, really just like to know that, that they're seen in literature. So these books are really good examples. And then again, supporting... Um, supporting the modulation of the psychomotor. You know, I think they're, they're really um, used to be good, being good at sports and having a lot of energy, um, just showing them that there are ways to modulate this in the classroom. So then the next one would be emotional overexcitability. And many gifted readers experience extremes of emotion. They might feel anxiety, guilt, or feelings of responsibility. They can be overly shy, have intense concern for others, a strong sense of right and wrong. Um, they might have physical responses to their emotions and often feel like they aren't good enough. So some great books for emotional um, overexcitability. There are, like we said, there are lots of others out there. You just have to look for them. Um, and you might've noticed that there is also some overlap. Some books are good for multiple overexcitabilities. And so Katie and I always try to kind of stress to kids, there's no really right or wrong with this. We're just kind of exploring and you know, whatever you think is, is okay. So for the emotional OE, um, 
these kids experience, um, need to experience things like hearing that you're sensitive to others' feelings, but you care very deeply and have deep feelings, some strategies for the classroom or um, even at home, learn how to actively listen and respond to what they are telling you, teach them to anticipate the physical and emotional experiences and rehearse ways that they could respond, um, effective strategies like using role-playing as a way to prepare them for when they know their emotions will take control, um, the use of journaling to express feelings is a great one to, um, to use with kids because often child, children can express themselves in the moment um, and then choose whether or not they want you to read their thoughts at a later time. So when I teach this lesson and I go through those um, five icon slides with the students and I introduce the overexcitabilities, um, this is a sheet that I've used. Um, I give everybody, every student in the classroom uh, a book. And then on this sheet, it has the list of the overexcitabilities and the characteristics underneath each. And what they have to do is they have to write the name of the book on their sheet. They have to write what overexcitability they think it shows. And like Kim said, there's really no right answer. Um, so many times students have said um, that a book was an overexcitability. And I was like, oh, I never thought of it that way. As long as they can prove it um, in that explain why section. Um, that's fine with me. So in the book, um, I tell them that they can either think about the characteristics of any of the characters, um, the events that happen to the characters, maybe it's the illustrations, which is a lot of time in the imaginational overexcitability, and they find it in the illustrations. Um, maybe it's the theme of the story, or maybe it's just a feeling that the text gives to the reader. Um, so again, no right or wrong answer. And I also stress to them too, when we're looking at this page, um, like if you had the psychomotor overexcitability, for example, you don't have to have, or a character or a part of the book, it doesn't have to have everything on that list to, to have the characteristics of the psychomotor overexcitability. It's not an all or nothing. So then these are just some student examples um, of what they've filled out on the sheet. So the luscious lollipops. Um, I thought this would have been a, um, um, an imaginational one, but this student saw it as intellectual. Um, I, I love that they said it made them happy um, because I, they, that student in particular, the intellectual overexcitability made them happy. And I like that they said, it's like a sentence problem where the adjectives are gone. Thought that was fantastic. Um, Mirror, if you haven't read that book, it's a, it's a picture book with no words. And so they were saying it was the emotional overexcitability because she starts off sad. And then throughout the book, she's playing with her reflection in the mirror and then she gets happy, but then the mirror breaks. So she's lonely again. And then <clears throat> this one for Mosque. I also thought Mosque would be imaginational because it has beautiful illustrations, um, but they thought it was uh, senses, like it appealed to their senses because it was like the beautiful illustrations and like, Show, they the students saying that the reader could appreciate the beauty. And then um, Tuesday, um, Imaginational, if you've never read that book either, there's like, um, I remember there's flying pigs. I, I'm trying to remember some of the other illustrations. It's another one that has no words. A little crazy. <laughs> All right, so then, um, so those would be, you know, five lessons. It could be five days in a row or however you wanted to, to structure it. Um, but then we thought the next two lessons involve administration of the overexcitabilities questionnaire and then interpreting those results. So the overexcitabilities questionnaire two came out of Dabrowski's research about overexcitabilities. There are 50 questions on this. Um, it's a multiple choice. It's not intended to provide a diagnostic information. So that's always really important, um, especially when you're talking with parents that this is not a diagnostic tool. It's just um, something that we can use in the classroom. Again, no right or wrong, um, but it shouldn't be anything that we consider a diagnosis of, of any kind. Um, it gives the procedures for scoring in it. Um, it uses, and we use a personality inventory um, written at the eighth grade level. So then again, 
The book Living with Intensity is an excellent resource if you're looking for more information about the overexcitabilities and how to teach or parent gifted students effectively. Um, we would highly recommend it. Um, the book provides two questionnaires, the OEQ short form and the OEQ revised. The short form is 12 short answer questions and the OEQ revised is a 24 questions um, revised to restore um, tapping experience through all five senses. All the questions in these um, require a short answer and might be great for discussions about the overexcitabilities. So there's several resources out there that, that you can use. So um, we created a Google form with the OEQ2 questions for our students to fill out, and then that way we can score them pretty easily. So um, the original would be this link, and the simplified wording of questions for younger elementary students would be this one. And so the cool part about using a Google form to do it is that you can collect those responses and then possibly see trends within your classrooms. Um, and so this is an example that I did with my class, um, with one of my classes, and it showed that um, those students weren't really into daydreaming, but they were very competitive. Um, and if you want to get really crazy, you can get a copy of the spreadsheet my niece made. Um, and it, you have to cut and paste the results into the columns, but the formulas are already made, they generated for you. Um, so they're green, yellow, and red. And then the green, if you if you come out in the green, it would mean that you have that exo overexcitability. Yellow means it's less likely, and red means not as likely. Some students might have an interest in overexcitabilities, especially if they don't experience, they might not, sorry, they might not have an interest in overexcitabilities, especially if they don't experience any. So we never force kids to participate in these activities, um, but the majority of gifted students we've worked with um, become passionate about their overexcitabilities, and it makes so much sense to them to put a name to those things that they're feeling or experiencing. And so I've also done the survey with high achievers um, who weren't necessarily gifted, but they also got super excited and they definitely felt like they had overexcitabilities as well. All right, so uh, when I share with the students, um, what I do is I usually, before I introduce the overexcitabilities to, the, to students, I have them take the OEQ2 um, to reduce confirmation bias. Um, so it's better for them to take it honestly without them knowing anything about the excitabilities first. Um, and then like Kim said too, the school I teach at, um, I, I teach this lesson to the whole classroom of students, um, even though there are gifted and not gifted students in there because, um, I feel like all people have an overexcitability, like maybe not to the extreme that gifted students do, but, but they can all relate to this. <clears throat> and so I also share it to the whole classroom too, because it's about building um, awareness and capacity with teachers too. So every time that I teach this, um, the teachers have also asked to take the OEQ too, um, so they can connect with students. Um, one teacher I had, um, I taught this to her class. Um, she had the intellectual overexcitability and she was able to connect so much better to her students, especially the ones um, like the psychomotor students that she um, didn't relate to as well. So what I do is when I share the results with students, I don't tell them what overexcitability they scored the highest on. And like, like Kim said, I'd never say this is the overexcitability you have. I say it's the one you scored the highest on. Um, I put them in a group with people that shared in like ways. And then they have to figure out what overexcitability they share. Um, the psychomotor group always figures out who they are first. Um, and they start skipping around the classroom and doing push-ups, which is a really good time to remind them, um, this is not an excuse for your behavior. This is you building awareness of who you are. Um, so they figure out the characteristics of their excitability. You know, those psychomotor kids again, do they have lots of energies? Are they fast talkers? Um, do they have trouble going to sleep? So they talk about the characteristics. Um, I feel like that's also a good time to, to, to talk about um, the characteristics they feel like are positive and which ones they feel like are, are negative. Um, because this is a good time too, especially with those psychomotor kids to think about um, like, why am I struggling with this in the classroom? Um, and then this part that building awareness with teachers, what, like, what do you want your teacher to know? And so many great times I've had kids say, 
I wish they knew I needed to stand up in the classroom sometimes. I wish they knew I needed to pace back and forth. Um, this is an also a really good time too. And I'm gonna use another student as an example. Um, I tell students, you can disagree with your results. Um, I had a student, she ended up with, um, scoring highest in the emotional category, um, screaming at me, um, I am not emotional. That is not who I am. Um, and you know, all the other kids in the classroom, they're, they're saying, no, remember, like, we're just, it's just trying to know ourselves better. She said that so many times. And I was like, you, you pick who you think you are, you know, um, if you disagree, like, you're not stuck with this. We are not, we are not labeling you. We are not telling you who you are. Side note, I think she really was the emotional <laughs> side note. Um, <laughs> all right, so then, um, I don't know if you guys have seen a lot a while ago, this was a really popular meme going around on the internet. Um, like it would say, you know, it would be like teachers, what my friends think teaching is, what my parents think teaching is, what, te what other teachers think, um, what I think teaching is and what it actually is. Um, so I took that meme and I had the, I have the students do it with their overexcitability. So they write their overexcitability at the top, um, that bottom right corner, I have them write the definition of their overexcitability. Um, and then what their friends think it is, their parents, um, their teachers, what they think. Um, that last box, I have them do a choice, which has gotten some really funny results. And um, I'm gonna just show you some examples from students too. All right, so, so this sweet girl, um, super loud. <laughs> oh, you totally should do it as an adult. It's so fun. Um, so, um, super loud girl, her, her parents have encouraged her um, interest in theater and dance. They've told her she's an actor her whole life. <laughs> Shouts out all the time. But um, she ended up with a psychomotor overexcitability. Um, really helped her self-awareness. I was able to, in class after this, I could be like, um, I'm not going to say her name, but I'd be like, oh, sweet girl, you know, just t turn the volume down a little bit. Um, but um, like you see the one with her teacher, like, it says, wow, she has a lot of stories because she talks all the time. And then what her cat thinks. So she's saying, I can't sit for this long. And her cat's going, I can steal her food. Yay. <laughs> and then psychomotor to her in that actually is. I love how she said, when something pops into my head, I really have to say it or I blow up great awareness for hers and her teachers. Um, so the next one, oh my gosh, I will tell you the school I work at so many kids because we have gifted and high achievers. So many kids <laughs> end up with the intellectual. I love his in the bottom right corner. Um, that's, that's him cross, trying to cross the street but he can't stop reading his book. <laughs> um, his little perfectionism self in the top right, like he can't stop writing because he has to get it right. And he's, he has so many more ideas he wants to type. Um, <clears throat> this emotional one, I love um, the what my friends think because her friends are supportive. Oh, she's, she's sad again, I better go check on her. And then a lot of kids too, um, it's interesting for what the, for the what my teachers think, they wanna go up to their teachers and say, what do you think? And I'm like, no, that's not the point. Like you, I want to know what you think your teachers think. But I think this is a girl. I think that she actually went up to the teachers and said, because she said, my teacher agrees that I am emotional and sensitive. And then the sensory one, you see that they all say senses at the top because I'm not brave enough to say sensory, the eight-year-olds. Um, that this one I love, she did what my dog thinks. Um, she said, I like how she scratches me, but she acts weird with my fur sometimes. I love that for the sensory, because <laughs> I could totally see that. And then, let's see. And the imaginational. Um, I love, she chose what my stuffies think. So she, she goes, get in there, white bear. And the bear's saying, thanks for the shift. <laughs> because they're like little real people. And so this is another example too, when they choose to write these, um, like, like the girl who ended up in the emotional group, I, I said, you know, you don't have to write the one you ended up on, write the one that you think you are. I've had kids say, can I do two? Of course, you can be more than one. 
So then um, the next part of our lesson would be um, creating affective goals for our learning plans. And then we have some extensions as well. And so as GT teachers in Colorado, um, Katie and I are responsible for writing an affective goal for every student, a new one every year. Um, but even as um, you know, a classroom teacher or a parent or someone else, you could also help those students write um, affective goals for at home or whatever. So um, this is, you know, again, from the teacher point of view, but you could also use it in other settings as well. So um, one way to make the overexcitabilities practical for our gifted students is to create affective goals for their learning goals. And again, this is a requirement in our state, um, along with academic goals for each gifted identification area. And so the student would decide which overexcitability they would like to address for the year, keeping in mind that it could be for a positive reason. Um, it doesn't always have to be a deficit reason. Um, the learning plan committee, which in our case would be parent, teacher, student, and GT teacher, um, creates a personal or social competence SMART goal around the targeted overexcitability. The student progr progress monitors their goal every 12 weeks to see if they're making any growth. Um, then the student would also reflect on their progress toward the goal and how the goal has helped manage their overexcitability. And so um, these goal choices relate back to the overexcitabilities, their affective competencies from NAGC, um, and they're also on our state's Department of um, Education website for gifted students. So each student would pick a personal competence goal or a social competence goal that relates to their overexcitabilities, keeping it really simple. Um, maybe select only one of the bullet points. A student with an emotional OE might struggle with resilience or risk taking. An intellectual OE student might struggle with perfectionism or stress. Um, an imaginational OE student might struggle with taking um, with talking to classmates or working in groups. Um, emotional OE student might struggle with asking to be alone because they're scared to hurt the feelings of others. Or these could also just be used as the student's strength areas as well. So again, not necessarily a deficit area. It could be something they want to continue to to build upon. So just a quick review of SMART goals for kids. Um, this template is for them to write their goal and then some examples and non-examples of SMART goals. Um, and these come from Big Life Journal. It's a great affective resource if you're not familiar with it. Um, lots of great affective ideas and tips for parents and teachers and lots of great activities um, on that website as well. So again, this puts it in kid language so that they can um, be specific and, um, and address all the parts of a SMART goal. So it needs to be specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and timely. And so um, these goal choices relate back to the overexcitabilities and the affective competencies from NAGC. So here would be an example of a personal competence goal and a social competence goal. Um, given practice and support in real world situations to demonstrate resilience, a student will grow from blank to blank as measured by the active of affective rubric. So that's on the right side there. So really just a simple zero to seven um, where they are now as the baseline and then where they want to be by the end of the year. Some students tend to make really lofty goals and they want to grow several points, um, but even just mentioning to students that a two or three point growth could be typical for gifted students for the year. So um, you want to keep your, real, your expectations realistic um, so that you can really hope to achieve that target goal by the, by the end of the year. So this is just the really simple rubric that we use. So then this is just to sum up, this is the timeline that we normally use. Um, so again, I give the OEQ2 first to reduce the confirmation bias. Um, then I, re I introduce the overexcitabilities. I've entered, depending on the amount of time the classroom teacher can give me, I've done all of them in a day. I've done them over five days and then use it with the picture books and then do the reflection sheets I showed. Um, uh, we have a, a conversation about uh, positive and, um, you know, modulation, I, I hate to say negative um, aspects of the overexcitabilities and how they can support themselves um, and the personal reflection sheets. And I will say too, um, 
it's a it's a good idea too. We I talked to my school counselor about this when I taught the overexcitability lesson because I had a student, she had the sensory overexcitability and she went down to the counselor and she said, hey, I have the sensory overexcitability. I need some fidgets in the classroom, which was fantastic. Advocating for herself knew who she was, but I made sure the counselor knew that she like, when she shared that information with parents too, like just to make sure like, this is not, this is not only who you are building awareness. <clears throat> and so what I'm going to talk now, the lessons eight and nine, um, the creating affective goals for L ALPs, Kim just talked about. So I'm going to talk about extensions. So Kim and I have been lucky enough to present this um, presentation several times. I, I like to think that we get better every time that we present it. Um, we've also taught it taught it. This will be my fifth year. I'm going to teach these lessons this next year. I like to think I get better every year that I teach them. So these are the extensions that I'd like to try it this year. And then also just an, another note on the ALP goals. Um, ALP goals can be tricky because they're um, student reflected. The students are reflecting on them. Just if you make sure that you are, are monitoring those goals, that you're also teaching lessons so they can show improvement on those goals. All right, extensions. So gotta give a shout out to Ian Bird and Lisa Van Gimmert, um, huge people around overexcitabilities, um, people that I like and respect that I get a lot of um, my inspiration from. I will say the two of them also put together a presentation on showing overexcitabilities to students. I've never used theirs because um, if you've ever seen the two of them present, they have a very distinct, um, presentation style and I it just didn't work for me the way I wanted to present it to students I preferred the icons but um, we do have a link to that in the next slide um, so this is an extension that Lisa Van Gimmert put together um, you could choose one of those books put the characters in the left column circle what over over excitability they have say yes maybe or no and the level of the intensity I loved that low medium or high um, and then kind of do these uh, reading response questions. Um, is one character have intensity stronger or weaker than the other? Um, are they public or private? Which I thought was interesting. Um, and kind of that, you know, level four DOK, um, would they find it easy or difficult to rid themselves of those intensities? So like thinking about Hermione Granger, could she get rid of her intellectual overexcitability? And then that link, at the bottom is the website that this came from. And then since Lisa Van Gimmert is also so great, she has a rubric that you could score them on for their written response, of course, which is fantastic too, because they could self-score and then you could self-score. Like comparing and crafting, contrasting the level of manifestation, um, thinking about how they affect their abilities to interact and function. Um, in Lisa Van Gimmert's slideshow, she actually does this with um, the Mysterious Benedict Society. She, if you haven't read that book, she goes through the, um, the characters in the Benedict Society, talks about um, what overexcitability they have and to what extent. Um, so that would be a good model to show students. And then the other extension I want to try this year, um, last year I got a subscription to Bird Seed TV, which is Ian Bird's website. Um, and I just discovered he has a video on intellectual intensity um, which he talks a lot about um, how when he was a student and he loved dinosaurs and how other students love dinosaurs, but he loved dinosaurs. And I think it would be fantastic this year to have students make their own videos about their intensities um, and using this as an exemplar. And I think Katie, you said it was free right now on his website. Oh yes, that vi that video is free. Like you have to subscribe to Birdseed TV, but this is a free sample right now. And he doesn't have any of the overexcited other ex overexcitabilities on there yet, which was another reason that I was like, oh, it would be fantastic to for the students to make more of them. All right, so um, we are kind of at the end of, of our presentation. Well, we did wanna share with you guys our contact information. If um, you try these things and you have feedback for us, we would love to hear it for sure, good and bad. We'd love to hear if you do um, try this with, with children, how it goes. Um, we have an article that's kind of similar um, to what we've shared with you today in the Sang Library. 
And then just all of our resources are, are listed here as well. Um, but we thought we'd save some time for questions and see if anybody um, had any questions or anything that you have tried um, with overexcitabilities with, with children that's worked or, or anything else that you'd love to share. We'd love to hear it. And Julie does have this presentation. So it's a, um, if you go to the um, Dabrowski Congress site, it's on there. Um, and you can like all of these are live links to get to all our resources. We checked them all, so they're all they're all good. Question? Yes, question. Um, I'll just jump in. Uh, yeah, on the first day, Sheila Gallagher presented uh, some information on overexcitabilities, and she mentioned that when there's uh, two to three overexcitabilities, you have a sort of um, a different effect. Were you able to detect through your use of the OE2Q? in presenting to children that there was a clustering of overexcitabilities in some people in the class? And how did that, uh, that awareness change with the kids and, and their own uh, self-awareness uh, manifest itself in, in how they uh, took risks and um, changed their behavior? Yeah, it was super interesting because in the results of the OEQ2, there were several students that got the same score on more than one overexcitability. Um, like typically it would be like, like sens sensual and um, emotional would pop up together. Um, psychomotor and imaginational would pop up together. Um, the interesting thing I noticed in students though, is they would, they would agree with one more than other. So I would say to a student, okay, you're, you scored the same on psychomotor and um, um, imaginational. And they'd be like, oh, I'm, I'm not imaginational, I'm psychomotor. And they would, you know, you know, skip off to those students. Um, like, I feel like, I feel like that's something I should, I should go back and look at her presentation to look more into to support those students better. That's a really good point. Do you have that same experience, Kim? Did you have kids that tied? Yeah, definitely. And even in my research, um, several students came out um, intellectual, emotional, and imaginational were the three that, that popped up the most. Um, and some students had all three. And um, it was a struggle for, for parents often, you know, especially because those students were um, ready to read material that they maybe weren't necessarily emotionally ready to, to handle. And so I know parents reported that was a, a big struggle, but I think giving kids those words about the overexcitabilities really helps them articulate um, sort of how they're feeling and being able to see how those um, struggles in other characters, I think has been really, really powerful for kids as well. I, I did the same thing. This is Alina Tree. Um, I work with kids and did, gave them the OEQ2 and then followed it up with a presentation on overexcitabilities, but I put it through the, the lens of Alice in Gifted Land and, and just put different characters and related each of the overexcitabilities to those. And they had a blast with it and several, well, almost all of the kids came to me later and they, they expressed how it was um, life-changing to them to know about these so they could understand themselves and their fellow students. It made such a huge difference in accepting each other. It became more of a celebration rather than that kid's weird. <laughs> so it was an empowerment um, kind of thing. And it's affected them to um, some of them even to today. One of them is now a doctoral student. And she, she was super, super high on psychomotor. She would come into the classroom turning somersaults. <laughs> and she could sit, she could sit in her chair. And I still haven't figured out quite how she did it, but she could sit in the chair and have her head on the floor at the same time. <laughs> so, but uh, we worked with uh, worked with her and got her some of these cushions um, that are that you have to sort of balance on ergonomic type cushions that's just a disc. And she took them to her French class and her U.S. history class, which she could not, which she was not doing well in. She was making C's, D's in them. And her grades went up to A's 
because she was able to she was able to understand her um, her over excitabilities and learn coping mechanisms. So we focused on that in class two. So thank you for this presentation. It can ex definitely be life changing for your kids. I would love to see that um, the Alice in Gifted Land. If you have that presentation, I'd love to see that. Um, and things I'd, I'd love hearing stories about the power of, you know, knowing yourself better and the over abilities. Yeah, and I think the, the, the main difference that I celebrated was the acceptance of others, which helps with uh, the whole TPD concept and, and being accepting and actually uh, becoming more of a, the kind of person that you want to be. Yeah. There, there's a question in the, the chat about um, peers and the importance of, of peers for, for gifted students. Um, and the question is, as a parent, will I be able to surrogate those needs? We are in the middle of nowhere, dead center in the middle of nowhere, so peers aren't available. Um, and I think this is a great place where books come in and that idea of characters can be friends for students as well. And so introducing them um, to different books and different characters, they can almost feel like um, characters, they relate to those characters, they can um, see some of the same struggles, they can see themselves Absolutely. in those characters. So I think that's that's huge as well. Absolutely. Um, but um, when it comes to sharing that experience with um, a peer, I mean, do you find that that is important for their development? I mean, obviously, it, you know, couldn't hurt, but, you know, I struggle with, with that. Where does yeah, things probably. like go ahead? <laughs> where where does things like dyslexia fit in with gifted students? Um, I am someone who did not learn to read until grade eight. So when you talk about the reading stuff, and that's because years ago, no one ever identified problems. I'm gifted in math and physics, but reading failed me. Uh, and, and, I, and as a 58-year-old person, I was identified with ADHD. So you've got this person that is um, could not sit still in a meeting for years and, and has some disabilities. Yet when I was, when I was tested in about grade nine, they said, do not let anyone stop her from going to university because I am gifted in many ways. So where does that fit in and how do you identify it? Like, what do you do with those kids? Are you able to identify the problems as well as the strengths? Absolutely. And, you know, I had some twice exceptional students in my research and one was a um, gifted reader who actually struggled in certain areas of reading. And so that can be really challenging. Um, and I think just finding, being able to find resources that work for them. So being able to, like one of the things that bridged the gap for that student was being able to use graphic novels, um, you know, like To Kill a Mockingbird, I think was, there was a graphic novel version of it that she was able to access okay. um, when her class was reading the novel. And so, you know, it wasn't a perfect fit for sure, but there were definitely some bridges that you can make um, with choice exceptional students so that they can feel successful um, as well. And I think, again, with overexcitabilities, I think it definitely makes them feel more understood and makes them feel like their struggles are um, important and meaningful and um, that they can learn from those as well. I went from the lowest reading category in grade eight to the highest because somehow something worked in my brain and my comprehension's wonderful. But uh, the idea of reading, I'd rather hyperventilate. 
Yeah, definitely. Um, there was a question about involvement of parents. Um, and really it's not, this, this part of it wasn't really a study. It was just a, activities that we did with our class. Um, definitely you can show parents the results, but again, stressing, again, this is not a diagnostic thing. This is more just um, informative and something that kids can, can enjoy and have fun with. But again, we're not diagnosing them with anything through the OEQ, that it's just um, something that, that we are interested in bridging over excitability to, to their goals. <laughs> the gateway drug to Nebraska, that's funny. Um, I, I really appreciate you all coming for an extra day for this conference to listen to us. Um, something, something that we're really passionate about and we would love, if you have more questions and you wanna to talk to us more, you can email us. Um, and thank you, Chris, for facilitating today. Um, we just really appreciate all of you. Thank you so much.